Hello, everyone. Welcome to this session. This is the third installation of the Climate Leaders, Stock and Rising Climate Leaders. And today is in regards to a climate issue, more specifically, air pollution and air quality. My name is Jonathan Pruitt. Glad for you guys to be here. Um, really hope this recording is helpful. And of course, if you have any questions, or comments, feel free to reach out to me and I'll for sure be there to answer anything you have. So from there, let's get started. I wanted to provide sort of an icebreaker. And in this icebreaker, I really wanted to give sort of a, a, an idea of where we're at in, in, in a community, um, in the space, as you know, this is a safe space, so feel free to um, answer if you would like, you don't have to, but I wanna get an idea sort of how many of you have or know someone who has asthma. This is a topic that's been prevalent in the Central Valley, and it's more common than you think now because of the area that we live in. We're pretty much destined to see a lot more folks live with asthma. So how many do you know that have asthma? And then the second question, which is kind of a two-part question, you know, where is an area that you've traveled that has had clean air quality? It could be in the, in the state of California, it could be somewhere else in the nation or outside the country. And then the other questions pertaining to this is, what about an area that had bad air quality? What was it? The objectives of this presentation is hoping we'd be able to get some sort of ideas from you guys, um, allow, before we go deeper in the slides, I, I wanna provide sort of objectives. Um, in the objectives, we're hoping that you know, climate leaders will be able to develop a basic understanding of air quality. Second objective is that climate leaders will be able to discuss air pollution with their peers. And last, climate leaders will be able to identify the state and regional agencies that protect our air quality. Now, here are some things to really start off with. So you guys, uh, either it could be a refresher um, or something totally new. Air quality. Now, that seems sort of a term that could be easy to describe, but there's actually a definition um, that is very easy to remember. Um, and air quality describes really the condition of the air that surrounds us. And pollutants, well, pollutants are pretty much substances that pollute, um, or in other words, that negatively affect um, something, and that's usually areas that are in the water or the atmosphere, more like things that happen within an environment. And the last bullet that I provided, which was the first law of thermodynamics. For those who don't know, this was sort of a, or those that don't remember, this is sort of an idea that came from your science classes, more specifically your chemistry classes. Um, this is an area that discussed sort of energy and matter and the, the characteristics among the two. And even though it might not be your favorite subject, I'm really gonna make my best effort to make it fun throughout this slide. So the reason why I presented this first law of thermodynamics is because it states energy cannot be created nor destroyed. In other words, something has to come from something else. It doesn't magically appear 
and disappear. So what am I talking about? What does this mean? Well, here's an example to get you familiar with it. Say you work at a coal-fired a coal-fired electricity generating plant. The coal is heated, which produces electricity. What else it produces is waste heat that is transported away as cooling water or gases. And we can't forget the various waste gases that gets emitted into the atmosphere, which causes pollution, such as acid rain, which is very harmful for the environment. So in other words, all the chemicals that make up the coal is burnt and it spreads out into various forms. It doesn't poof out of nowhere. It has to go somewhere. I want you to really keep that in mind throughout these slides, um, just so you can understand sort of the context of what I'm gonna be talking about. In the next slide, we really go more detail on how air quality is classified. Air quality is usually identified as being good, moderate, or poor quality. Good air quality means that the air is clean based off federal standards and visually clean without any smoke, dust, or smog. Moderate means that the air is not clean and or clear, but is safe for healthy individuals, but may not be safe for those who are sensitive to air pollution. Those who are sensitive to air pollution may deal to symptoms like coughing or shortness of breath. Poor air quality means that the air is not clean or clear due to pollutants such as smoke, dust, and smog. No one is safe. You can even be healthy. No one is safe from poor air quality. You'll notice that great is never used because air quality can never be great. Air quality always has some traces of pollutants, which can be safe for some and harmful for others. In the next slide, we really go more in depth about the four factors of air quality. And the quality of air quality, the, the, qual the quality of air depends on the four factors, such as the amount of pollutants, the type of pollutants, the rate at which the pollutants are released in the atmosphere, and how pollutants are trapped in an area. I hope this gives you sort of an idea of how to classify it and how to look at it in a measuring standpoint, because these are very important. Because each one of these measurements really depends and sometimes are used to identify certain criteria of pollutants which we'll go more in depth in the next slides. But I want you to think of, an ex think of this as an example. If air pollutants are in an area with good airflow, they will mix with the air and quickly disperse. Air pollutants tend to remain trapped in the atmosphere when certain conditions or factors such as valleys and mountains restrict the transport of these pollutants away from an area. When this happens, pollution concentrations can increase rapidly. Allow this evolution map of California give you an idea on the geography. You have the Sierra Nevada on the right side and the coastal ranges to the left of the San Joaquin Valley in the middle. Offhand, it looks like a pit in the middle of the state. And that's exactly an accurate depiction of the geography of Central Valley. The Central Valley is literally a valley, which means that it's surrounded by mountains and has flat ground. Let me give you a visual on how air flows through different ways. In this gif, 
it breaks it down by the different aspects of airflow. And this is depending on the angle of the object, which in this case, it's a wing, but it could be anything. And look at the stall part and how the air starts to curve like a circle. Now think of that object similar to a mountain. A mountain would stall air, which would cause airflow to be sporadic. With this in mind, here's a picture on how air flows around a valley that shares two mountains side by side or on each other side. The air really doesn't escape and instead recycles through the valley, usually from north to south of the valley. Majority of the air sits, which is a bad thing. Remember, airflow is important because it allows things to breathe. Without enough airflow, this gives more opportunity for pollutants to sit in an area for long periods of time. And you could probably understand where I'm going from this. So we were able to define what pollutants were. Now let's go deeper to see what are the types of air pollutants. This is important to know because lots of technical information pertaining air quality include these terms in some way or another. But you should be able to differentiate all of them. It might take time, but I'm gonna try my best to explain it in a simple way. Here, we have the first one being carbon monoxide, you know, also known as CO2. And a majority of the sources, they come from vehicles and machinery that burn fossil fuels. Lead is another one. Lead can come from many things containing metals, such as lead acid batteries and old paint. Nitrogen oxides or NO2, when it's interacting with water, um, it can form actually things called acid rain, which is really bad for the environment. And it's also found in burning of fuel and power plants. Ozone, ground, now there's good ozone and there's bad ozone. What we're gonna be talking about here is bad ozone, which is considered ground level ozone. And this is harmful because it actually creates sort of a substance called, 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 it develops a sort of a substance called smog, which is very harmful, especially in urban areas. I'm not sure if you guys remember, uh, an example would be in 1990s during um, the LA. LA was hugely known around the globe it's having one of the worst areas of smog. Particulate matter or short PM. It's a mixture of solid particles and liquid droplets found in air. We'll go more in depth in the next slide. And then sulfur dioxide or SO2. This is found in burning of fossil fuels and power plants, almost similar to NO2. Now, like I said, in the next slide, we'll go more into that in PM, which pretty much is more important than the others because it's more predominantly known across um, all areas regarding air quality that really impact residents more. And here's why. Well, PM starts, uh, stands for particulate matter, also called particulate pollution. The term for a mixture of solid particles and liquid droplets that are found in air. Some particles such as dust, dirt, soot, or smoke are large or dark enough to be seen with the naked eye. Others are so small that they can only be detected um, through a specific microscope 
that that can really see electrons, which are very, very small atoms. Particular pollution includes PM10, which are sizes of uh, cells with diameters that are generally 10 micrometers and smaller. And then we have PM2.5 with diameters that are generally 2.5 micrometers and smaller. Now, how small is two, uh, PM2.5? Well, think of a single hair from your head. The average human hair is about 70 micrometers in diameter, making it 30 times larger than the largest fine particle. Hopefully that gives you some perspective. PM2.5 is extremely small. Some are emitted directly from a source, like construction sites, unpaved roads, fields, and smokestacks. Particulate matter contains lots of droplets, and those droplets can be harmful for your health because it can go through your lungs and sometimes can get passed into your bloodstream. And over time, those particles that come from that pollution start to impact your organs. And then from there, um, your organ system. Of all these things, particles that are less than PM 2.5, those pose the greatest risk of health. And we'll go more into depth on the overall issues on health impacts from air pollution. Fine particulates. Like I said, in people in 2.5, they can cause shortness of breath, wheezing, coughing, chest pain, and fatigue. And then fine particles can make things really worse with those who have cardiovascular and heart disease, as well as those who have asthma and COPD. And then we have ground level ozone. Remember the smog that I was telling you about? Health impacts from there can become difficulty breathing deeply, shortness of breath, a sore throat, wheezing and coughing, and fatigue. And those who can really have conditions worse are from those who have asthma, COPD, and those with emphysema. Following this slide, you're probably wondering, you know, who protects the air? I, I wanted to give you sort of um, a breakdown of three jurisdictions that oversee the air quality in California. First, we have the federal government. And the federal government, known as United States Environmental Protection Agency, they, they do a lot. Um, not just air quality, but a lot more other things. But they themselves really set the standard for air quality uh, uh, for the nation, for other states to follow. Uh, they provide the standards um, and they also regulate interstate transportation. And what does that mean realistically? Well, it means that they look over trains, ships, and planes. These are areas where pretty much anything that's our, that comes from transportation hubs that cross over multiple areas of states and state lines, that's typically the federal government's needing to be overlooking. And then we have the state or the California Air Resources Board. They're the ones that focus mainly on state issues and they regulate mobile sources of air pollution greenhouse gas emissions, and then consumer products. Um, they look at cars, trucks, and buses. And they're the ones that work with DMV. So you know how you always have to get a smog check every single year? Well, it's actually the rules made by the California Air Resources Board, which sets the standard to work with the DMV to make sure that your cars are not polluting as much and that they have the proper um, air filters for your cars, the proper materials 
so that your cars don't emit as much. And then we have the local jurisdiction here, regional, which is the Valley Air District. It is an air district. And there are a lot of them in California, air di the Valley Air District being one of the biggest ones. They actually regulate stationary and local sources of pollution. So they don't deal with things that are mobile, that move around from areas to areas, but more things that are stationary, that stand as like a building. And here we have examples such as factories, refineries, and residential wood stoves. All of these areas, all of these agencies are important. Um, they do all other things. There'll be a time for us to go more in depth on what they do, um, but this is the basic information that you probably will need so far. In the next slide, we go more into talking about, you know, how you can really view all of this air quality index in your area. Here are some four options for references that I were able to come up with that you can actually check out on your own. Airnow.gov is a federally regulated monitoring data collection center. And the EPA regulates this. This is one where they work with all the states to make sure that all of the monitors are federally regulated and they're monitoring the proper um, air, da aid, air data. SJVAir.com is one that's actually not as regulated as needed. It's, it's a community air monitor led by actually a nonprofit organization in Fresno. And they've actually developed a really strong network of over 100 air monitors. And this is community led. And it's very exciting. And this is fairly new. This actually, this uh, SJV Air has been around, I believe, close to two years now. And it's amongst one of the biggest used ones so far. And I'm really excited to see how far it goes. But I highly recommend utilizing this because it does provide real-time data. And then you have Purple Air, purpleair.com. Purple Air is a, a really good website where folks can really buy air, air monitors that cost around $200, they're pretty cheap. A lot of air monitors cost around, you know, it can cost from 500 to 1,000. But being able to buy affordable air monitors, allowing the community to have ownership of the data and place it onto an open source um, database is pretty important. And so this is what Purple Air was able to do. And then we have the Valley Air Districts app called RAN. The RAN app um, is another sort of option where, of course, you have to develop or you would have to develop a, a, an account to be able to use this app. But it is user friendly and it does do a good job with providing a, a, an ease of information specifically for your area and does provide updates for you through texting, through emails, or wherever other way you want to get notified. And this is just an, an, uh, sort of an example of what the map is or what a air monitoring map looks like. This is from the purple air, uh, purple air map. This map has actually really increased in, in, in air monitors. I remember there wasn't this much about two years ago, but I think people are really understanding it or they're realizing that it, this is important, that data collection is important because that opens doors for more grants, for more opportunities to bring in more research. Um, and also communities are starting to realize that, you know, if I want, if they need, if they want to really get empowered in this work, it's really up to them to really take the step to 
you know, place an air monitor at their home and being able to read it um, and being able to then assess and share out the data through an open source like Purple Air. But, but all in all, all of this with you know, the four references I've provided, there's actually more that are out there. But overall, the, the, the message here is that data is data. The more data, the more sources, the better. The better it is, the more likely we're able to see some sort of transparency and accountability. Um, and it allows for more opportunities for, for funding to go into local programs um, for cities that probably didn't have the opportunities before or didn't have the capacity, but having the ability for communities to become their own science scientists is encouraging, it's empowering. Um, and it really just took an air monitor to get the ball rolling on things. And I'm gonna end um, and William, you can stop and pause for folks to be able to uh, interact with the activity and reflection. And here's a follow. -up. Have you ever looked at air quality data before? How do you feel about using it now? Do you feel iffy about it? Is it, you know, do you feel comfortable? Do you still think there's a need for training? I can always do, uh, I can provide sort of a one-on-one training um, for you guys that there's, um, there are ways, you know, sometimes some of them have a learning curve, but after a while you get used to it. And then out of the ones I provided to you guys, which one would you use more often? I'd be, I'm curious. I've actually haven't used the Valley Air District app just because it's an app. I haven't had the chance. The other ones you can actually use through browser. Second question is, you know, has there ever been concerns in your community regarding air pollution or air quality in general? Third, was there a time you or someone you knew had health issues regarding the air quality in Stockton? This is a big one. And last question, how would you relay this message to your community so that they are aware of all of this, from the air quality to the air pollution to the air monitoring. How do you think we can relay this message? You know, if it's not you, how do you think we can do it? How do you think the, you know, the organizations can help in your community? Do you think there's a need for another training? Do you think there's a need to do a virtual training or an in-person training? Let us know. And with that, that's all my presentation. I really do appreciate you guys uh, being able to watch this. Um, if you have any questions, any comments, please reach out. Um, look forward to talk to you guys soon. Um, and hopefully I'll see you guys um, in the next session. All right, everyone, have a great day.